Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. Have you guys ever wondered if you had what it takes to join the Galactic Empire military? You know, bring peace and stability to every corner of the galaxy. Oh, it's beautiful. You make sure all those non-human scum know their place beneath your boot. Which branch of military would you serve in? Would you be a marksman in the Stormtrooper Corps or an interrogator in the ISB? Or what about a weapons officer in the Imperial Navy, like Ben was? Or would you choose the most dangerous and glorious job of them all, becoming a TIE Fighter pilot? So how does one become a TIE Fighter pilot? Well, let's begin from the beginning. Whoa, whoa, whoa that's, that's way too far, man. Go back a little bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. There. At the end of the Clone Wars, the New Republic was still a relatively non-militarized organization. The Clone Grand Army was the first standing army the Republic had had in many centuries. There were several regional and planetary defense forces, but more or less there wasn't a galactic-wide infrastructure to train soldiers. As the Republic turned into the Empire, Palpatine began phasing out the clones. He determined they were too vulnerable due to their shared genetic material. I also heard from another source that he just didn't like their faces. All, all of their faces. So the Emperor started a massive militarization program where he created an armed force out of the citizens of the Empire. He consulted with many of the leading military authorities in the Empire to figure out how they could consolidate the Republic-era academies into a more unified and standardized system. Eventually, this would become the Imperial Academy Network. Most planets with a significant enough population had junior academies. These were one-year prep schools which prepared and screened teenagers as young as 13 for Imperial service. Upon being accepted, these new cadets were put into eight-member squads that would serve as their class for the next year. The junior academy was a ruthless place. The curriculum and instructors encouraged cadets to be extremely competitive. That meant there were often serious injuries and even death. This, of course, would disqualify you from further training. Following the orientation program, a series of different tests were conducted to assess each cadet's strengths and weaknesses. Some schools, like the Jalukan Preparatory Academy, had relatively standardized training courses, while others, like the Academy for Young Imperials on Lothal, had advanced training facilities like the Well. This consisted of a series of repulsor-projected platforms that made up a constantly moving obstacle course. The rewards for winning these sorts of tests often meant further opportunities to learn from their instructors or Imperial soldiers in the field. The losers were given menial tasks like cleaning out the latrines. This made every activity highly competitive. Sometimes the competition would even get violent, which was officially against the rules, but all a part of the plan. The Empire wanted to bring out the animal nature in their soldiers, and then tame it. Along with physical tests, the cadets were trained in basic military strategy, weapons, and vehicle proficiency, along with some technical skills that every Imperial soldier should know. These academies were also secretly used to test for individuals with high midichlorian counts. Four sensitive individuals were sent to a program called Project Harvester, where they were continuously tortured by the Grand Inquisitor. At the end of their one year at the Junior Academy, the cadets that were left were given a final grade and assigned to one of the many Senior Academies across the galaxy. The Senior Academies differed in quality. Amongst the best were the Royal Imperial Academy on Coruscant and the Arcanus Academy. Placement in one of these top schools would allow cadets to make important connections that would direct their career into the upper echelons of the Imperial command structure. However, there were limited slots to these best schools, and cadets from the core region were given priority over outer rim territories. Former Separatist worlds like Jalukin were often only given one or two slots per class. Senior Academy took two years. Along with their continued physical training, their education became more advanced and specialized. A sample curriculum could include core world classical studies, security protocol and interrogation methods, and my personal favorite, field identification and culinary class. Individuals were allowed to use a fighting simulator to train with an assortment of weapons and vehicles. All students were subjected to current events, which was an imperial propaganda class. It was very important that students became good soldiers, but it was even more important that they became good Imperial citizens. Following senior school, the best of the best, those with the most extraordinary skills, were singled out for specialized training. Those with terrific physical abilities, marksmanship, and aggressive demeanors were sent to Stormtrooper Academies. Those who were superior tacticians and leaders were sent to officer school. And those with a hunter's mentality, superb reflexes, and low self-preservation were sent to Flight Academy. 
The fighter pilots of the Empire were perhaps the most arrogant and competitive individuals in the entire fleet. Which made sense. The TIE Fighter program had a 90% dropout rate. There were two branches of the TIE Fighter Corps, the Starship-based Imperial Navy and the Ground-based Imperial Army, respectively called the Backheads and Groundhogs. No matter which branch you served in, the training was cutthroat. Imperial pilots were told that aiding their fellow pilots was last priority. The mission always came first, even if it meant losing your life. This was reinforced by the fact that the standard TIE Fighter had no shields, hyperdrive, and a very basic life support system which required pilots to wear vacuum sealed flight suits. Fighters were trained to be mentally, physically, and technically sound. They were expected not only to fly their TIE Fighters, but to do full maintenance on them as well. The pilots would train in simulators and graduate to real starfighters. Their final tests were often aboard ships or at bases that were in the middle of combat operations, where failure meant death. Every Imperial class star destroyer has over 30,000 crew members. Amongst them were only 72 TIE Fighters. They were reserved for the most reckless and talented individuals in the entire Navy. The TIE Fighter pilot knew that they were flying in essentially what was a plywood box, but they fully embraced the danger of their position. Some were even completely against the idea of putting shields on their ship because they thought it would make their job less challenging. So, do you have what it takes to be an Imperial pilot? Some of the best rebel pilots like Wedge Antilles and supposedly even Han Solo started out their piloting career in the cockpit of the TIE Fighter. Let me know in the comments below what you guys think. Now me personally, I'm not a huge fan of the TIE Fighter. I prefer ships that I can pilot without putting any pants on. Which is why I filmed this show from the waist up. Now I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Don't forget to hit that subscribe and notification button so you don't miss out on all of our latest and greatest content. And a special thanks to all you Patreon supporters out there for getting us through this ad boycott. Uh, if you guys are interested in joining the Imperial Academy, Ben has personally agreed to write you guys letters of recommendation. So just check the Patreon link right here. If you guys are interested, send him a personal message. Please do bother him. Uh, and yeah, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.